Hello, I'm Kim Freeman, and welcome to St. David's Bible Study. Greetings to the roomies and the zoomies on the screen and those who watch on YouTube. And if you're watching online for the first time, we'd love to send you the free class study materials. So just email the church at parishadmin at stdavidchurch.org, and we'll have you join us. So let's begin with prayer. Lord, please pour out your blessings upon our class, and I pray that as we would walk through the words of Romans, that you would open up our minds to understand them, and may we find the love of Christ to be irresistible. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, and verse 1, let's begin with Paul's greeting. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So the Christians in Rome knew Paul only by reputation. He's not yet visited this capital city. So Paul took six verses to identify himself and establish his credentials and mission. You know, when identifying himself, Paul could have selected any number of important titles. He could have referred to himself as a Jewish scholar. He could have called attention to his personal encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. He could have bragged about his years in the mission field or the number of churches he had planted. Instead, he chose a designation he considered far loftier, far more impressive than any other, servant of Christ Jesus. He emphasized his highest allegiance first. And the word servant implies obedience to a master. Paul gave up his freedom and willingly submitted his life to Jesus. So remember that the Roman church was composed of two groups, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. So Paul's use of the word servant would have shocked the Gentiles in the church there, but it would have appealed to the Jewish brethren. You see, to be a slave in the Gentile mind was to be at the bottom of the social order. To the Jewish believers, however, being a servant of God called to mind a roll call of those God used in the Old Testament, like Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Amos, all were called servants of God. And the word apostle means someone sent with a commission. So it carries a sense of divine appointment in contrast to self-appointment. Jesus directly called Paul to be an apostle, and the word set apart means it was for a specific purpose to preach the gospel. Previously, he had been a Pharisee separated from Gentiles. Now he is separated for them. Verse 2 says the gospel was promised beforehand through God's prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Do you know that the first mention of the gospel is in Genesis 3.15? That's where God said to the serpent, I will put enmity, which means hostility and antagonism, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So the phrase, you will strike his heel, refers to Satan's repeated attempts to defeat Jesus during his ministry on earth. But the phrase, he will crush your head, foreshadows Satan's defeat when Jesus rose from the dead. So a strike on the heel is not deadly, but a crushing blow to the head is. So already in Genesis, God was revealing his plan to defeat Satan and offer salvation to the world through Jesus. Well, in verses 3 and 4, Paul declares several truths about Jesus. Look at these phrases. Regarding his son, who, as to his human nature, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is a mouthful, so let's describe it this way. Jesus was born of a physical mother, Mary, making him fully human. He was conceived by the spirit of holiness, making him fully divine. God's son is revealed in two ways. According to the flesh, he was born of Davidic descent. But according to the spirit, he was declared son of God because he rose from the dead. So Jesus is the Messiah promised long ago to David in that beautiful promise that's in 2 Samuel 7. And then the phrase, Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. It means anointed one. And Lord acknowledges Jesus's power and honor in his position. 
by saying our Lord, Paul is demonstrating a theological kinship with his audience from the beginning. It's an appeal to unity because they share a common bond. Well, in verse five, he says, through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles. So Paul is conscious of having a task to do for God. He'd received grace, and grace is always a gift which is free and unearned. Remember, in his pre-Christian days, Paul had sought to earn merit in the eyes of men and of God by meticulous obedience to the law and by his works. But Paul now knew that salvation depended not on what man's efforts do, but on what God's love had done. It was all about grace. So what does Paul mean when he says the phrase, to the obedience that comes from faith. Well, the purpose of the gospel is to produce obedient faith. That's the desired response to the gospel, that believers would obey God. Paul is describing our lifelong walk of faith, our surrendered lives, our radically transformed lives that try every day to be consistently obedient and submissive to God and his will. See, in Paul's mind, there's no separation between faith and obedience, between believing and doing. And when Paul says, for his name's sake, Paul means that the goal of this gospel preaching is for Jesus to be honored and glorified. In verse 6, he says, and you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So Paul reminds the believers there that they too are the called of Jesus and they share his mission. It's obvious that Paul has the world in his sights, and he wants the Roman believers to catch his vision. In essence, Paul is saying, you Romans are an example of what I must do elsewhere, for you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus. In verse 7, Paul identifies his audience as, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Yes, you are a saint. Saints are holy ones, not because of personal merit, but because of God's love and call. And the double blessing of grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ is a signature greeting for Paul. Grace summarizes the gospel in a single word. It's the undeserved favor of God. And peace or shalom means complete wholeness and well-being. Verse 8, he said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. So Paul's use of the word first would lead you to expect the word second, but Paul's train of thought gets carried away. Do you notice there is no word second? He fails to continue the sequence. His words just tumble out over one another. But here, Paul is affirming them. And he expresses his personal admiration for their reputation of faithfulness. Well, who would have expected a thriving community of Christian believers in the capital of the pagan world? This was something to talk about, and people were spreading the word. In verse 9, he said, God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. So Paul never fails to include them in his prayers. And the only time that Paul uses the phrase, God is my witness, is when there could be some reason for his listeners to doubt him. So it's as though Paul was saying, I pray for you all the time, and I'm not just saying it, I really mean it, and God knows it. It's a Christian's privilege and duty to bear our loved ones and fellow Christians to the throne of grace. So even if we're separated from people, even if there's no other gift we can give them, we can surround them with our prayers. In verse 10, he goes on, he says, and I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. You know, Paul's been in ministry long enough to understand the value of being physically present with someone. They might think he lacked integrity for often expressing his desire to come to Rome, but then never getting there. So he says he truly wants to visit them. And yes, Paul did eventually arrive in Rome, but only after being arrested, jailed, shipwrecked, and bitten by a poisonous snake, and more. Read Acts chapters 21 through 28. Uh, well, in verse 11, he says, <clears throat> I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. 
Can't you feel how much he yearns for a face-to-face -face visit with them? The spiritual gift seems to be related to Paul's preaching of the gospel. It would be insight or teaching that would deepen their faith. He plans to share the knowledge that God had given to him. But I love verse 12. He says that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. See, Paul treads delicately here. I just love how he doesn't want to antagonize his readers by posing as a superior who condescends to inferiors, because if his faith can strengthen theirs, so can theirs strengthen his. Each can find precious things in the faith of the other. Paul meets them as an equal because he says, so that you and I may be mutually encouraged. Mutual spiritual edification. This is still true for Christians today. It happens in this class. The blessing runs in both directions. So think about this. The Roman church began and prospered without Paul ever having been there or establishing it. And it would have been tempting for a lesser leader to convey the I'll take it from here kind of attitude and barge into a situation and assume that everyone would immediately promote him to the top of the pyramid. But Paul was wiser. Paul knows about the reciprocal blessings of Christian fellowship, and although he is an apostle, he's not too proud to acknowledge his need of it. He's anxious to receive as well as to give, to learn as well as to teach, to be encouraged as well as to encourage. Paul is humble. Verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. You know, they may have often wondered why this famous apostle never came to pay them a visit. It's reasonable to conclude that Paul's delay in reaching Rome was due to God's will. God had kept him far too busy evangelizing the Gentiles east of Rome. He goes on to say, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Well, Paul's passion to preach the gospel to the Gentiles bubbles to the surface. His clear priority was to tell the world about Jesus, and he yearns for a harvest of the unsaved. In 14, he said, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. Now, it may seem odd that Paul speaks of Greeks when he's writing to Romans, but you see, at that time, the word Greek had lost its racial sense. Alexander the Great had spread the Greek language and thought all over the world. So a Greek was no longer one who was just a Greek by race or birth, but one who knew the culture and the language of Greece. And when Paul uses the word obligated, it implies that he is a debtor. A debtor is someone who owes something to another, and in Paul's case, it was the debt of love. It's as though Paul says, I have been given the good news from the Savior Jesus himself, and now I have the responsibility, the debt to pay, to pass on this news to someone else. In ancient times, a non-Greek was viewed as an uncultured barbarian. Really, this was in my commentaries, that word someone living on the fringe of the empire's frontier. So what Paul is doing is boldly affirming that the God is for all people everywhere, the cultured Greek, the uncultured non-Greek, the learned, the ignorant. Paul's not insulting these people, and he's not being prejudicial, and he's not viewing them as inferior. He's merely using the language of the time to stress that his indebtedness extended to the whole world. Verse 15, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Paul's passion to preach just burns with urgency. Even after two decades of repeated struggles with great hardships like hunger, thirst, exposure, shipwreck, robberies, beatings, imprisonment, stonings, Paul the missionary remains eager to fulfill his calling in places yet further from home. The gospel was life to him, and he knew it would be life to others. I love my favorite verse of the whole chapter, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. 
When Paul said he was not ashamed, meaning he's aware that belief in a carpenter from Galilee as the savior of the world poses some credibility problems, it must have seemed to be an absurd belief that a Jewish man was actually God in human flesh. And stranger still, that someone crucified like a common criminal on a cross was called the savior of the world. Still, Paul's assurance of that truth gave him boldness. And that phrase about first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, that's a statement about the order of God's plan, not an indication of relative value. Jew first indicates the priority of the Jews in salvation history and their election as God's people. And we'll see that the role of the Jews is a major issue in the book of Romans. The Jews were given the first opportunity to receive the Messiah during his ministry on earth. And Paul even followed this pattern of Jew first. Whenever he went to a new city, he recognized his obligation to carry the gospel to the Jews first. So a strategy was to begin teaching in the Jewish synagogues. And he was usually ejected with great hostility. But from then on, he would take it to the Gentiles in that city. So starting with Israel, the gospel is flowing out to the nations. And Paul is inviting the Romans to partner with him in that proclamation. Verse 17, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. So that's one of those churchy words. Let's define righteousness. It means a right relationship with God. That's simple. Because of the fall, our relationship with God has been fatally damaged and needs to be reconciled. The gospel is God's way of extending his grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness. It's his way of restoring sinners unto himself. And it is through this restoration that we receive righteousness from God. God offers it through the gift of faith. We gain eternal life and a relationship with our Heavenly Father. God considers believers right with himself, even though we are not yet perfectly and morally good. But we are legally in right standing with God, even while we exist in a sinning state. God calls us righteous, even when there are days we clearly don't deserve the title. He also calls us saints, holy and clean, long before we exhibit those characteristics. Righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. If that verse confused you, what Paul is doing there is quoting the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk to show that throughout all time, salvation is now and always has been a gift provided by grace and received through faith. One receives right standing before God by belief, not deeds. So by quoting Habakkuk, Paul was stating that righteousness by faith is not a brand new idea. It's been there all along. In verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. All right, the wrath of God is a pretty terrifying phrase. That is God's personal anger against sin. So Paul explains humanity's danger like this. Man is subject to the wrath of God because we've rebelled against him and sinned against other people. No one is exempt from judgment, as Paul's going to show, not the Gentiles, not the Jews. So what draws God's anger is godlessness and wickedness. Let's define those terms. Godlessness disregards God's rights, and it's a destruction of our vertical relationship with him. It's an utter rejection of God himself, his deity, his authority. But wickedness disregards human rights, and it's a destruction of a horizontal relationship with those around us. Put together, it's a breaking of what Jesus said were the greatest two commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor. However, the wrath of God is not like the kind of bellowing, revengeful anger we might associate with abusive people, something that's just out of control. No, God's response to sin is a passionate expression actually of his love, his outrage against wrongdoing, and it's completely consistent with God's character, which is love. His wrath is fearsome, but controlled and utterly just when confronted with evil. The godlessness and wickedness, Paul says, are carried out by people who do this, suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
So let's explore that. In verse 19, Paul insists that men cannot plead ignorance of God. He says, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. See, Paul's pointing to creation. He says, God has surrounded you with evidence of his handiwork. Just gaze into space through a telescope and you see evidence of his power. Or peer through a microscope, and you still see evidence of his intellect. The words clearly seen means our capacity to take in information with understanding. So man was made to be a spectator of this beautiful world and lift his eyes up to the creator because nature itself is the best teacher. But the problem, Paul says, is not humanity's ignorance of God, but humanity's rejection of him because God's creation proclaims his handiwork. So the problem is not lack of truth, but suppression of the truth. It's not an intellectual problem. It's a problem of the will. And the words without excuse means no one can claim that God hasn't left sufficient evidence of his existence. The fault is with those who ignore the evidence. Verse 21, he says, for although they knew God, but though not in a saving sense, but they know God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, which would have been fitting responses to God's revelation. But instead, men rejected this revealed knowledge of God, and then their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So they substitute counterfeits in God's place, which is idolatry. Their hearts are foolish because they rejected God's lordship over their lives. And I know this isn't a particularly enjoyable part of scripture. It kind of taints your impression of the book of Romans, but it will get better. But what Paul is doing, and when we get to the end of this, if you're not squirming in your chair, you're, then you're not really understanding the gravity of sin. It's pretty hard truth right here. So Paul is saying there are only two categories of entities in this universe, creator and created. And to worship anything else besides God generates offense. Humankind's rightful place is looking up to the creator, ascribing glory to him. But we prefer the illusion that we are independent and can call the shots and we can decide what is right and wrong, not God. And we're not grateful because we don't accept what God has done for us and around us. Would people act as if, as if they do not know the truth about God and ignore him? Then their hearts become increasingly dark and Paul says they move to idolatry. Verse 22, although they claim to be wise, they became fools. So rejecting God leads to self-delusion. 23, when people exchange the glory of God for images made to look like man and birds and animals and reptiles, they fell into idolatry. So idolatry is rejecting the prominence of God. It's usurping his rightful place with something else. It's giving devotion to created things rather than to the creator. This theft of glory could not be more foolish. We were created to worship the creator. So if we reject him, we will worship something else. We have to live for something. And there has to be something that captures our imagination and our allegiance. Because what we worship, we serve. And it becomes our bottom line, the thing we cannot live without defining everything we do. We give created things our ultimate affection, which really belong to God alone. Our fallen nature prefers a creator who doesn't hold us accountable for wrongdoing, but God does hold us accountable for sin, whether we acknowledge his presence or not. And the consequences of rejecting him in favor of sin are far graver than we imagine as we look at Paul's next verse, verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies to one, with one another. God hands people over to their lusts to achieve a specific purpose. Scholars call this judicial abandonment. 
Maybe the most helpful illustration of God's judicial abandonment comes in the Old Testament. Think back to when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years as a result of their unbelief, but God tenderly and miraculously sustained them by providing manna, the stories in Numbers 11. But what did they do? They pined for the food of their Egyptian slave masters, complaining, but who will give us meat to eat? The Lord responded, I will give you meat and you will eat it. And you will not eat it for just one day or two days or five or 10 or 20, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord. That's a yucky piece of scripture, I know. <laughs> so likewise, God says to humanity, in effect, the sin for which you lust, you will have until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. The things we serve will not set us free. They control us. We have to have them. But there's good news. God's purpose for turning people over to their impurity is redemptive. Like, hear that again. His purpose is redemptive. Paul tells us three times that God's scariest form of judgment is a decision to stay silent and hand us over to our sin. Paul uses a phrase to describe that. He says three times, God gave them over. Man chooses to deny God his due honor, so God acknowledges that choice and abandons man to the consequences of it. Paul does not say it's a final abandonment. It's not a condemnation to hell. God gives people over to their wretchedness so that at last they will recognize its horrors and turn to his mercy. And it is not God's angry irritation. It's really much more the sorrowful regret of a lover who has done all he can. In 25, Paul says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. See, is there any escape back? That was the clue at the tail end of verse 25. The creator should be forever praised. Amen. So the way out is to stop suppressing the truth and praise God as God, to accept his right to rule over us, to desire him more than we desire anything he made. Where do we find the motivation to do this? Well, it's discovered in the gospel where we find that godless and wicked though we are, in Jesus we are loved and accepted and blessed and set free. And this is what leads us to praise our creator. Amen. <laughs> All right, verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Now, up to this point, Paul has been em emphasizing humanity's vertical relationship with God. Here, he turns to the horizontal effects of exchanging God for an idol. I know it's a controversial passage, but Paul minces no words. Look at his phrases, shameful lusts, unnatural relations, indecent acts, perversion. In verse 28, he says, furthermore, since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They reject him as God. They reject his authority to determine right and wrong. They reject his judicial right to hold them accountable. So they're separated from God. And in response, God formalizes the decision with a tough love, severe mercy decree from heaven called judicial abandonment. The creator and his creature stand on opposite sides of a deep, wide chasm called sin. So humankind is judicially separated from God, helplessly estranged and in peril. And a depraved mind means that every aspect of one's being is affected by sin. But there's good news here. There is still something in the sinner worth saving. And that's why Jesus came to die. In verse 29, Paul begins a very long vice list, 21 words. They became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, on and on it goes. These are people that have willingly ignored their creator, their knowledge of right and wrong, the penalty of sin, even to the point of what happens in the last verse, 32, praising the wrongdoing of others. You know, this left God no other choice than to separate himself from mankind. So God said, in effect, 
Your willful rejection of me has left me no other choice. I must put you out of my presence. And whether we realize it or not, there could be more dreadful condition than this. Paul's closing verse 32 says, those who do such things deserve death. Let me say again, there is good news. Judicial abandonment is not the same as the rejection. It is instead the first step in God's plan of redemption. Remember how Jesus taught his disciples about the relentless redeeming love of his father in the parable of the lost sheep. God never stops searching for the lost. So are we to think that there's no hope for those involved in this lifestyle? No. It's likely that Paul hopes that those caught up in such living will grow weary of its consequences and turn to God for forgiveness and healing. In conclusion, in chapter one, it's true. Paul described a pretty downward spiral of sin. People knowing the truth, suppressing the truth, replacing the truth with idolatry, allowing idolatry to justify immorality and choosing to live in depravity. And finally, even encouraging others to live there, even though they know it's wrong. So let's look at the summary for Romans chapter one. All right, Paul and the Romans, potential partners in the gospel. The, it outlines where Paul talks about his credentials, his concern, his confidence, and then the revelation and rejection of God. The Apostle Paul, known only by reputation to the Christian community in Rome, presented himself and his message to the church. Desiring to enter into a long-term partnership with the Roman church, he boldly set forth his credentials and his message, called by God to preach the gospel. Paul's letter was a prelude to a future visit, a letter of introduction, for he'd never visited that church. Considering the impressive words Paul could have chosen, it's significant that he portrayed his relationship with God using the words servant, apostle, and set apart. Paul said, in essence, I'm committed to my calling from God. My ministry is not my idea. My concern for you, I believe God wants us to be partners in the gospel. And my understanding of the gospel, it's the only thing that can save humanity. Paul declared the gospel was promised beforehand. He described the human and divine side of the incarnation, a word that means Jesus, son of God, made flesh. Paul reads his Old Testament messianically, and Jesus is the climax. Paul ex expressed his thankfulness for the believers in Rome and assured them of his repeated desire to visit them. He was eager to come in fellowship with these believers who knew how to thrive spiritually in the heart of the Roman Empire. On the one hand, Paul was compelled to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. On the other hand, circumstances had hindered him from preaching in Rome. Paul celebrated that the flag of the gospel had been planted in the capital of the ancient world. Although we're not told who planted it, it was clear that Paul took no credit for establishing it. However, Paul said he faithfully prayed for them and asked that God might open a way for him to come visit them. And God eventually answered Paul's prayer. Just read Acts to give an account of how Paul made it to Rome. Paul longed to impart some spiritual gift to them, most likely the blessing of his preaching, but he humbly asserted that encouragement should flow in both directions. They too had gifts to share with him. The believers in Rome might have wondered why Paul never came to visit them, so he assured them that it was not because of a lack of desire on his part, but that he had been prevented from coming. Paul said he was obligated to Greeks and non-Greeks. What Paul meant was that his message and his obligation was to the wise and simple, the cultured and uncultured. He had a message for the world, and it was his ambition to someday deliver that message in Rome too. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, meaning he was not ashamed of the scandal and paradox of the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus for the sins of the world is an abhorrent thought, but nevertheless, it is the power and wisdom of God for salvation. The gospel of Jesus is spiritual, dynamite. The gospel message is the power of God in verbal form. It transforms people. And when it is explained and reflected upon, its power is released. 
It does what no other power on earth can do. It can save us and reconcile us to God and guarantee us a place in the kingdom of God forever. The only way to receive it is through faith. Paul says the gospel's power is boundless and boundaried at the same time. He says it came to everyone, yet he also sets a limit on it. It is for everyone who believes. In summary, the gospel is a living force, its power. The gospel can save anyone, its scope. The gospel saves only those who believe, its condition. The gospel came to the Jew first, then the Gentile, its history. Both Old and New Testament believers are saved by faith. The content of salvation may have changed between the two testaments, God's revelation through Moses and God's revelation in Jesus, but the method of receiving that revelation leading to salvation in both cases was based on faith. Paul states that as God's righteousness is revealed, so is his wrath. We're about to read one of the Bible's saddest segments, but also one of the most important. Man's spiritual diagnosis is tragic, but it's vital news we need to hear. These verses are a sobering account of man's spiritual condition. Yet if we don't understand the truth of that, we won't understand why we need salvation. First, a diagnosis must be given before a cure can be prescribed. And what draws God's anger is godlessness, sin toward God, and wickedness, sin toward others. God's constant emotion toward those created in his image is love, but his love becomes severe in the face of sin. Paul writes of people willfully suppressing the truth. So God is justified in revealing his wrath against mankind because it has suppressed the evidence of his existence. All God's creation bears his fingerprints. Humanity failed to glorify him or give him thanks. Because people have chosen to reject him, God has allowed humanity to demonstrate to itself exactly how devastating life can be when lived in rebellion against God. Three times, Paul mentions that humanity exchanged such knowledge of God for a sham substitute. And while God has given humanity freedom to refuse him, he has not freed man from the consequences of his own choice. Humanity's rejection of God left him no other choice but to pronounce judgment, which began with his giving them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. Theologians call this judicial abandonment. In response to their straining against the leash, God simply releases his grip and allows humanity to run headlong into sin and its consequences, thus allowing them to consummate their lusts and suffer the cost of getting what they want. God grants man the separation from himself that he deliberately chooses. People fall into futility, spiritual blindness, and total departure from God. In conclusion, Paul's aim in writing is to introduce himself to the church at Rome and to lay a foundation for a partnership with them to carry the gospel to the far reaches of the known world, Spain and beyond. This letter, which they will have had time to hear and digest before his arrival, will be a theological education for them. If this church is going to partner with him in spreading the good news of Jesus, they must know the truth of the gospel and the heart of the apostle to the Gentiles. This portion of Paul's letter is important. If the believers in Rome do not think that all people, including themselves, deserve God's wrath, then there will be no motivation to take the good news of Jesus to a world desperately in need of the gospel. Yes, Paul paints a horribly bleak picture of mankind lost in sin, but it's important to lay the spiritual foundation because in the back of his mind, he is waiting breathlessly, I might add, to share the wonderful news of the gospel to which his letter is pointing. No one can be saved without first recognizing and admitting that he's lost. If we're open to his message, it will find its target in our lives. Our acknowledging, honoring, and thanking God develops a conscious recognition of him. So salvation is a saving from sin and death in God's wrath and a saving for eternal life. Oh, thank you, Lord. There is hope at the end of this chapter. Anyway, thank you for being with us. God bless you. See you next week.